Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay here. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about the Sansui AU717 integrated amplifier. Now this is a very old integrated amplifier. It's nothing new. Um, this was manufactured from 1970s to 1980s, I believe. And Sansui was a Japanese company. And the model name is AU717. Now Sansui was one of those companies where they made audio in the golden age of audio, as people would call it, right? So they were up there in terms of uh, in the performance with Marantz, you know, Denon, and all these Japanese companies making really good stuff. And one of the most sought after pieces, uh, in my opinion, was the AU717. Because first of all, it's not like a really, really high end model where it's really expensive. Um, even used, but this is something that you can afford, you know, for maybe 500 US dollars. You know, maybe the price has gone up since I was in the vintage world, maybe, you know, under a thousand for sure. And for that kind of money, <laughs> I mean, this thing literally had everything. It had bass control, treble control, you know, so tone controls which we don't see too often in today's market, especially not under a thousand dollars. And plus we had like subsonic, you know, a phono stage that's actually usable and sounds pretty decent. Not the quietest phono stage, but for turntable lovers and just someone who wants to get music out of their integrated units, it has it and it still works. And talking about working, this thing works flawlessly. It's reliable. One, it's, these are one of the amplifiers that's reliable. And yes, there's some problems and we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, but it's not big problems. These are highly reliable. I mean, if, you, if these were manufactured in the 1970s, right? And they're still kicking and working in someone's house today and you see them you know, on the market very often, then that means that there's quite a bit of these around that people bought and is still using. You know, I've seen people who bought this as a third user, you know, second user, fourth user, you know, fifth user. I've seen people have this in the garage and they just take it out and try to, uh, you know, use it with a Variac and then slowly bring it up to room temperature. And voila, it works perfectly for years. In fact, I have a client, ex-client who used to have this amplifier and he still does for 10 to 15 years and it's still kicking. It's still making great sound. And sound wise, how does it compare to modern stuff? Well, let's take a look. First of all, I've, re I've reviewed a lot of modern day amplifiers and they sound great. They sound for the money, they have come a long, long way amplifiers. And some vintage people may not like this, but they have they are much cleaner sounding. They are more controlled in the bass, right? That's what modern amplifiers are good at. You hear the finer details in the music. But some vintage audio files don't like that. And let me tell you why, because they come across a little bit more analytical. The Sensui AU717 and stuff from that era is just more musical in a way that's full bodied, Yes, the bass may be a little bit more sloppy than a modern day amplifier, maybe not as tight, but thing, the thing kicks out bass. I mean, it's dynamic, it's fun, and it does have a little bit of that, you know, treble sparkle going on, so it's exciting. And guess what? If you don't like the sound, you can tone the treble down, or you can crank up the bass because the thing has tone controls, which you don't see too much in today's market. So for a beginner, definitely worth it. Now, it's not all bells and whistles and unicorns, you know, on this thing. There's problems, it's old. So there's bound to be problems, as reliable as electronics can be. I mean, imagine your computer that's 20 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old, like this thing, <laughs> it's bound to have problems. But it's not big problems because this is a good engineered dual model design. First of all, it has this problem where the glue that Sensui loved to use, and actually not just Sensui, Marantz, you know, I think some of the Denons at the time, a lot of, you know, 
units at that time, and I've worked on some of these pieces before, has glue in it. Yes, glue. And, you know, <laughs> these glue actually had a purpose. It was to keep the components together, um, to dampen them, and mostly to keep them, you know, stop from bumping into each other. But it was good material. I thought, I believe it's called polychloroprene. It's a fascinating material, but the problem was they never tested it for long term, like 50 years or something like that. So what ended up happening was the thing has properties where it literally eats up the components when it starts to corrode. Yeah, so this thing can corrode. And so what would happen is sometimes the components would get corroded, you know, along with the glue. And if you don't get it repaired, it will start falling off and stuff like that. And, you know, the funnel section may not work. The subsonic button might not work. You know, sometimes you may have channel imbalance. So there's multiple different things that could happen. It's vintage, right? Even if you bought it from someone trustworthy like your friend or a reputable seller with thousands of, you know, uh, reviews or whatever, this can happen. If, if it has never been repaired, this, this is uh, something that uh, Sensui and Vintage Gear is famous for in that era. But the good news is repairing it is time consuming, but it's not that hard. Now I've done it, it's, it's a pain in the ass, but it's not that hard. It's not some like next level, you know, technology, like you're not working on a Tesla or, you know, trying to work on a hybrid car. You're basically working on a Toyota, right? So the parts are relatively cheap to replace and there's a lot of them, but they're relatively easy to replace and easy, relatively time consuming and, and annoying to remove the glue, but you can remove it. And heck, if you choose to, and you know, I take no responsibility here, you can try it yourself. But after you buy it for $700 or something like that, under a thousand, let's say you bought it for a thousand, still worth it in my opinion. The cost to repair it from a technician, you know, I'm talking about taking out the capacitors, replacing the, the ones that are bad, you know, making it good for another 20 years or 20, 30 years, right? Would cost you about 400 to 500 USD, right? And we call that refurbishing or, you know, restore, restoring the amplifier. I would say for $1,500, it's still hard to beat, you know, for that kind of money, where are you going to get a, by the way, this is a dual mono design. Basically, it's a dual mono design. You know, where are you going to get under $1,500 these days that has all these features and just sounds darn good? You know, it's a very balanced sound. It has sweet highs, good bass, but again, it has tone controls for you to do whatever you want with. Yes, it doesn't have a remote control. It would be very weird if it had a remote control. So yes, you have to get up from your chair and you know, switch the volume and stuff. But the good thing about this, again, is it has speaker A, speaker B, speaker A plus B, which means you can drive multiple different speakers if you decide to have a, you know, $500 speaker, you know, $200 speaker, and you want to compare, then you can. And you can play them at once or separately, whatever you want. It, it, it's, it's a fascinating amplifier. Now, of course, the backside, it uses only bare wire. Now, you can choose to make that into you know modern day plugs or you can leave it as it is and use bare wire i think that's totally fine bare wire you know i've used them a lot of the times now if you really don't like bare wire because you like to switch different cables or whatever you're doing in there then you can always get adapters where one end is bare wire and one end is the connector so this way you won't have any problems connecting you know different types of cables that you may have that's a nice spade or nice banana. Well, that sounds great, but how much power does it have? Well, this thing is rated for, I believe, 85 watts per channel. And you see, Japanese people back then, and usually engineers, really, in that era, rated things conservatively. It's not like some modern day amplifiers where they try to measure the maximum point where the amplifier breaks, and it's like, oh, it broke at 1,000 watts. 
a thousand what it is into eight ohms. No, these guys rated it conservatively. So it can output almost 100, 110 watts in some cases, someone measured it, I believe. And they said it measures, you know, to output more than 100 watts sometimes. So really, unless you're in a big, big room and you need, you know, big, big power to drive your speakers, unless you have like Apogee or MagnaPens or something in a big room that needs more power and more current and more drive, this thing will practically power anything. And it runs pretty cool and pretty quiet. And again, it's very reliable, especially after you get them checked out by a technician. So my suggestion is, yes, you do, you should take it to a technician if it has never been repaired. And even if there's nothing wrong with it, just go over, see, you know, if anything needs to be cleaned out, you know, the chances are the glue corrosion is already doing some damage. You're just kind of waiting for that to happen. So taking it to a technician and doing damage control is a pretty smart idea. So I would suggest highly for you to do that if you do consider getting one in the used market. And these have rack handles in the front. Some of them have rack handles, some of them don't. The ones with the rack handles are a little bit more valuable. For your purpose, if you're gonna put it on a table or a rack or you know hi-fi rig, then we don't really need a front rack unless it's for aesthetics and you like that kind of rack handle. But the rack handle was because it was mounted onto a rack in studios. So I've seen a dozen of these in studios, and you know, you know, they still kick some of them still have them around and they're still kicking and they're still making sound. Now I've owned like three of these and I wish I never sold them. But I bought them and then I needed the money, so I sold them and then I bought them again when I had some money. And when I was broke again, I sold them and repeat and rinse. Now I started doing all these reviews and stuff, so you know, kinda defeats the purpose of me having one here. But if I ever got a chance, I would buy one and keep one for myself. No questions asked. I mean, under 1500, you know, repaired, you know, where are you gonna get that? But it requires some headache, requires some work from your part. It's not just like you're buying from a shop and say, hey guys, you know, it has crackling problems. I want a new one. That's not gonna happen. You know, you're buying used from a, you know, a seller somewhere online. You know, once you buy it, it's your responsibility. So make sure to hear it and make sure it's working at least when you buy it because if it's making sound and good sound at the time you purchase it that probably probably means that you don't need to fix a lot of things and it will cost you no more than five hundred dollars to fix it but if one channel is gone then you don't know what that problem is exactly so you probably don't want to buy it if it's making no sound that's it from me so make sure to subscribe and like the video if this was helpful to you and also these videos are made possible by my Patreons. If you want to consider becoming a Patreon or if you like the work I do, then consider checking out my Patreon page and I'll see you guys on the next one.